Um, Nihao is a self research scientist at Google. Um, and uh, in Zurich, he works in Zurich, uh, where he's currently a member of the Cone Optomics group and works on automated methods for high throughput brain mapping at synaptic resolution. Um, and um, he works collaboratively with uh, research uh, with Harvard University, Max Planck Institute, Munich. And prior to Google, uh, he did research in the fields of computational fluid dynamics and stochastic dynamic systems. So thanks for joining us and we're looking forward to the talk. Well, thanks so much for the nice introduction and for inviting me to the conference. So yeah, my name is Michal and I'm a research scientist in the Connectomics group at Google. And today I'd like to tell you a bit about the work that my team and I do. Uh, and connectomics in this uh, context that we are talking about today means synaptic resolution of structural neurobiology. So uh, that's a bit of a mouthful. So let me try to briefly unpack the statement for you. Um, as you might remember, brains are complex systems built from many types of cells, uh, the most important of which are neurons. And those neurons have complex shapes. Uh, they form directed connections at specific points in space uh, called synapses. Uh, in which we communicate with each other through chemical, chemical and electrical means. And modern neuroscience predicts that the structure of those bio biological neural networks largely determines how brains actually work. Uh, the synapses themselves are generally sub-micron in size and as such require electromicroscopy at nanometer resolution to fully resolve. And what we are doing in our group is we are building technology to automatically map those neural networks from large volumetric data sets acquired with uh, such electron microscopes. Uh, that involves developing and implementing new algorithms, deploying them on real data sets in collaboration with our academic partners. And uh, most of the software that we develop is released as open source so that it can benefit the whole neuroscience uh, community. Uh, in addition to building to tools for um, analysis, our group also develops infrastructure to just store and visualize those, those large data sets. Uh, we have a particular focus on cloud-based data storage and in-browser visualization. Uh, all of this is also open source and our web viewer for free data uh, called Neuroglancer is now in particular widely used both within the connectomics community and in related fields. Um, Within Google, we are a relatively small team of uh, research scientists and software engineers. And as uh, Monica, I think, mentioned already before, we collaborate quite closely with various academic partners. Uh, that includes the DEN group at Max Planck, uh, the FI lab at MIT, the FIM project at Generia, and uh, the Lichtman lab at Harvard. Um, so, so far, I have given you a very high level picture of what we do. And let's dive into some of the technical details now. Uh, the creation of one of those brain maps, or connectomes as we call them, is a complex multi-stage process. And it starts in the wet lab with the extraction of a piece of brain, uh, then it's fixation and staining. Uh, uh, this sample, once it's prepared in this way, is then cut into extremely thin sections, uh, typically tens of nanometers thick, uh, and which is more than a thousand times thinner than a human hair. And those sections are been imaged in an electron microscope to produce large grayscale images up to millions of pixels on the side. And up to this point, all the work is normally done by one of our academic collaborators. And only once data is scanned, uh, does, our, does the work of our group actually start. Um, so we kind of work on this part of the, uh, of the pipeline. And then our task is to um, align, uh, stitch, and those images into a three-dimensional volume, uh, correct any irregularities that might um, be present there, segment the neurons, uh, detect the connections, classify any objects that we reconstruct into biologically meaningful categories like axons and dendrites. And at the end of the pipeline, uh, we hope to get a richly annotated data set, which can be used by our collaborators and the wider uh, research community to build as well as verify and refine neuroscientific models of how brains uh, operate. So let me now tell you a little bit more about this uh, segmentation step, which is one area where uh, a lot of my work has been focused. Uh, the images that we work with look like this. Uh, what we are seeing here is a section for a sample of human cortex tissue acquired by the Lichtman lab at Harvard. And uh, every pixel in this image belongs to, uh, to some cell in the brain. And what we are doing in the segmentation is we are giving every object visible in the image its own separate identity, here shown with arbitrary colors. Uh, crucially, uh, this image is just a 2D section for a much larger volumetric data set. So what we are really doing is identifying 3D objects like this neuron. 
Uh, and of course, there is a lot of such neurons in the brain. And while segmentation could, in principle, be done manually by human annotators, it would be prohibitively time consuming. And the manual approach is only really viable at a relatively small scale. So this is exactly where automation and machine learning come to the rescue. Uh, and within our group, we have developed a specialized segmentation approach called uh, phosphonic networks, or FFNs for short. And both FFNs are a particular type of convolutional neural network, uh, which uses a relatively small set of human annotations to learn this general process of tracking neurons in those large volumes. Uh, both FFNs work uh, sequentially, processing a relatively small field of view at every step, which you can see on the side, uh, kind of highlighted with a small red box on the left side. Uh, and they track a single object at a time. Uh, the crucial feature is that they as they take as input both uh, the microscope images, so as a column on the left, and their own trial predictions uh, when building on on outline of the object that they track. So the trial predictions are depending on the, the right-hand column. And uh, if you were to kind of you know look at how this works on a 2D cross section, so it would be something like this. So here the yellow dot illustrates the center of the field of view of the network, and the blue color illustrates the interior of the object that the network is. Uh, tracing. And again, this whole process is really done in 3D, so here is kind of a more realistic visualization of um, what, what the segmentation process looks like, and we can see an FFN tracking a dendrite in a piece of brain region called Area X. Um, when we kind of combine those FFNs with some additional uh, post-processing techniques, we can use them to build uh, fairly rich reconstructions of brain tissue, like the one shown in the video, uh, it might appear that there's quite a lot of stuff going on, but it uh, should be kept in mind. But this is actually just a small fraction of what a tiny volume, uh, just a tenth of a millimeter, uh, a cube, just a tenth of a millimeter on the side actually contains. Uh, and indeed, if we were to look at more detail, uh, things become kind of considerably more dense. Uh, so for instance, this is, these are all axons that cross between two faces of a relatively thin uh, 10 micron thick slab of human cortical tissue. And you can see that there are empty spaces there and also where the cell bodies, blood vessels, dendrites, glia, and all the other kind of tissue pieces are. Uh, and nervous systems are complex regardless of the species. So we have seen bird, we have seen human, and uh, now we are looking at Drosophila, so the blue fly. Um, uh, and yeah, we're just looking at different kind of subsystems uh, within the reconstruction of the blue fly brain that we released in collaboration with the fly M project at uh, Genelia in 2020. So yeah, you can see this is, uh, uh, it really is quite complex and contains uh, quite a lot of stuff. Um, at this point, you might be asking yourself, uh, what is the challenge here, right? I mean, yeah, we have seen those reconstructions, they look nice. And I would argue that the challenge here is twofold. Uh, the first problem that we are facing is that of scale. Uh, basically, if we were to use this to um, look at a cubic millimeter of cortical tissue, which is a volume just slightly larger than a coarse grain of sand, uh, if it was to be imaged with volume EM, uh, that would generate more than a petabyte worth of images. Uh, and that's you know two to three orders of magnitude more than your typical laptop hard drive has in uh, 2021. Uh, this cubic millimeter also contains tens of thousands of cells, uh, many millions of cell fragments that just pass through the volume, but have a somewhere also in the brain. And all those branches taken together um, form several kilometers worth of pathways, um, all folded up in this small cubic millimeter uh, cube. And they connect together in up to a billion places, so up to a billion synapses. And if you were to step through those pathways one pixel at a time, uh, it would take 100 billion steps to, to trace through all of them. Uh, so that brings us to the second challenge, which is that of accuracy. Um, because of the large amounts of data that are involved in, in this mapping, um, even error rates that look good in absolute terms can lead easily to interoperably high number of errors in the final reconstruction, which then makes the interpretation of the data difficult. And uh, one metric that we like to use to track progress in this space is something called expected run length. Um, which is just trying to answer the question of how far can you trace a neuron before encountering a mistake. And this is kind of like mean time between failure in engineering and sometimes people also like to make the analogy to self driving cars here. So, you know, the analogy would be how far can the computer drive before a human operator has to intervene. And uh, just for some context, if we had a purely manual system, so just a single human annotator working unaided on the raw data, um, this run length would be about a millimeter. Uh, so you might know this is quite a bit shorter than the kilometers that are necessary to, to trace everything uh, in one of those large data sets. Um, 
So when we started about uh, six years ago um, with the best technologies that we had um, at our disposal at the time, and notably they were already utilizing modern machine learning like neural networks. Uh, so both technology only um, allowed us to reconstruct neurons in the form of many relatively small pieces, which you can see on the left. Uh, the picture also illustrates uh, two types of errors that one can make in the segmentation, and those are splits. Uh, so here you can see them as colorful pieces in what should be a single cell. Uh, as well as mergers, uh, which are here actually mostly hidden, but if you look closely and compare the two neurons, uh, you, you can see that the one on the left has more stuff and, and both are errors, it just shouldn't be there, like the blue fragment on the left uh, in the bottom right. Um, so going, going forward in time, things quickly improved and at the beginning of 2017, we were able to reconstruct much larger uh, cell fragments in of, of these medium-sized cells. And in terms of this expected run length uh, metric, uh, that was about a millimeter worth of, worth of error-free path length. Uh, and things have improved about an order of magnitude uh, since then. And what that means uh, in practice, you can kind of qualitatively see from the two sample uh, cells shown on the slide, um, one from an older data set and one we reconstructed uh, just last year. Uh, there has also been significant progress in terms of just being able to tackle significantly larger volumes of data. And yeah, we have seen about a thousandfold uh, progress or increase in the uh, last four years. So when we started, uh, state of the art was a small cube, about a tenth of a millimeter on the side. And uh, going forward, we were able to work on um, a relatively large fragment of a Drosophila brain. And, Recently, uh, volumes of about a cubic millimeter have been mapped, have been reached, um, such as this uh, human cortex sample from the Lichtman lab. Uh, it's actually large enough to cover all protocol layers, um, all the way from via to white matter, if you know some, uh, yeah, brain, brain structure. Uh, so this cubic millimeter might seem like it's quite large, um, especially in comparison to the data sets that we just had a few years ago. But um, let me try to put this into perspective for you. So here's a section for an MRI of a human brain. Uh, images like this might be familiar to you. Maybe you or somebody at some point had an MRI like this. Um, and uh, this image also includes this one petabyte data set that I showed on the previous slide. And yeah, can you see it? Maybe not, um, but it's actually right here. And uh, if I zoom in a bit, it's going to become a little bit more clear, hopefully. So we're going to end up at a, at a 40x zoom uh, factor relative to the first view. And I can see it clearly in context of that MRI. So the thing to note here is that, you know, there's this huge one petabyte data set, but that corresponds to just a few pixels, a few voxels of this high resolution MRI. So there's, you know, still quite a lot of ways to go to be able to think about, uh, say, a whole human brain. Uh, so here's the same thing, just illustrated slightly differently. Um, uh, yeah, as I said, it'll be, we are, we are about a factor of a million away from uh, a human brain, maybe 10 times less than that, uh, away from a primate brain. But arguably the next kind of my major milestone for connectomics is the broadband, uh, which is uh, five time, uh, 500 times larger than uh, what we can do today. And indeed a whole brain, uh, whole mouse brain effort is already uh, in the planning stages in the US. And if recent progress is to be any guide, uh, I think we can expect uh, this whole mouse brain mapping project to be doable at some point in the 2020s. Uh, so I hope I was able to give you a taste of what connectomics is all about and why it requires highly precise and automated methods and also what challenges still remain and why there is still a lot of exciting work to be done. Uh, if you want to learn more about what we do, uh, please do check our team website. Um, among other things, it has links to some of the reconstructions we have completed together with our academic partners. And those are all publicly available and viewable in the browser. So if you ever wanted to look at the brain up close, uh, now is your chance. And you can do that after the conference without uh, getting up from your desk or wherever it is what you're connecting from. Uh, the, the Google AI blog is also worth watching if you're interested in any of us uh, because we have more data and code releases uh, scheduled to happen later this year. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. Uh, thanks for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions if you have any. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Miha, for the really interesting talk and very nice visuals as well. Um, we have, uh, I think, um, 
while I'm, we're still waiting for some questions uh, in the in the chat or in the Q and A, I would like to ask you um, why it's uh, actually. Oh, actually, no. Before I ask, maybe there's a question from the audience that I'll go with, as I see one. Um, the three D segmentations are uh, and reconstructions are amazing. That's coming from Agata and Nega. Are the, those tools accessible to scientists who are not software experts so they can um, use them in their research? Uh, so in principle, yes. Uh, the, there is no kind of you know um, requirement to be a computer. So as I said, the, the code is open source, and uh, there is no requirement to uh, you know be a, be a software engineer or anything to to run this in any way. Uh, in, in practice, this is not, uh, the segmentation itself is maybe not uh, turnkey, right? So this is not something where you just go to a website, press a button and it works. Um, there is a little bit of configuration files maybe to be written and you should be able to install packages and so on. But we are actually happy to help. So if you email me or, or ping me on uh, yeah, um, Twitter or somewhere, I'm, I'm happy to uh, you know provide you with links to the documentation and maybe answer any questions you might have about this stuff. Cool, that's great to do that. Um, the question I have was uh, related to why uh, why is actually Google interested in this particular topic? Yeah, that's a that's a great question that we get very often. Um, so I, I think there are many reasons. Uh, one is that I think this is uh, one area of science where uh, we are maybe uniquely positioned to, to be able to help and kind of accelerate progress. This is just because of the kind of large amounts of data that I mentioned. And I think this kind of necessity to use a lot of machine learning kind of meshes as well very well with um, uh, you know the, the expertise that we as a company have. Um, and the uh, the other reason, uh, which is you know maybe uh, more of a long-term view, is that if you look at the um, history of uh, modern machine learning, in particular the area of neural networks, a lot of that work was at least early on uh, heavily inspired by, by prior findings in neurobiology. And I think there is a you know hope that uh, in the long term, as we become better at understanding biological intelligence, some of that might some of those insights might kind of pay off in the form of improvements to, to machine learning. So, you know, uh, as amazing as all the progress within machine learning and AI, however people want to call it, has been in the last 10 years, it, it should be kept in mind that many of the models um, are still vastly uh, inferior to, you know, what human babies can do or what animals can do, right? So there's still a lot of improvement there to be made, um, particularly in, in, you know, adaptability and robustness and, and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Thanks for your answer. Um, there's also one question from uh, Jonas Slonka. Uh, can you also do time evolution, spatial, temp spatial temporal dynamics? Yeah, um, so not with connectomics. Connectomics is, uh, um, uh, it, it's structural only, right? Basically, the brain is, is fixed in time and this plastic resin, right? So <laughs> once it's embedded, uh, it's no longer a piece of functional tissue. But what you can do um, is that there, um, Find, uh, there are imaging modalities like calcium imaging that you can um, apply to uh, a live uh, piece of brain tissue before you do connectomics. So the, the goal actually in the field is to have more and more data sets that are functionally imaged before uh, the structural acquisition. So you, you get something even richer at the, at the end, right? So you have both the structure and the, some of the dynamics at least. Um, you, you cannot really do both at the same time though. So, so there will be a, a temporal separation between the uh, yeah, acquisitions. Great, um, cool, good to hear that. And so uh, we are coming to the end of this session. Uh, so thank you, Miha, again for a really interesting presentation and thank you to all the speakers of this session. Uh, we will now have the poster session